Hey internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. It's almost Christmas, so uh, just for fun, I thought I'd try something a little bit different today. We're gonna go with a whole bunch of questions, rapid style, I'm trying to just kind of pop, pop, pop. All right, here we go, shotgun style. Ah, ooh, ooh. Rev Fisk, I've been talking to friends about predestination and I showed them Romans 8 to explain that we cannot have free will when it comes to God. But they said that the mind is only hostile before the Holy Spirit comes to them. But that once the Holy Spirit comes, they can choose to follow God if they want. I can see where they're coming from and I want to give a good Lutheran response, but I can't. Please help. That's the crazy thing. Actually, they've proved your point for you. That the Holy Spirit comes and then you have the ability to choose as a renewed, regenerated man. But this is the biblical teaching. The word is preached and on this word about Christ's death and resurrection for you. The spirit is coming. He's alivening your heart so that you're like, whoa, I want to believe this. I want to follow Jesus. I actually need to make some changes in my life to improve how I'm living toward other people because I'm a forgiven sinner. That's the Holy Spirit's work. So that's exactly it. They have Lutheran theology without realizing it and without using it to overturn, I'm assuming, a false decision theology that they're actually advocating because what they're saying is that before the spirit comes, you're able to say, I'm going to choose to follow Jesus and become a Christian. And then the spirit comes. So what they're trying to do is hold the two positions at the same time and one of them is biblical and one of them is not and rather than hold to the two positions at the same time that the Bible holds which is law and gospel they're trying to hold to I make a decision for Jesus and so it's my decision that saves me but somehow this is the Spirit's work and at that point you just got to start asking questions you know where do you get this whole decision for Jesus thing because it's just it's not there in the New Testament I mean try to find it see a lot of baptisms though hey and what do you know with these baptisms you always have what follows baptism the Christian life where it's after the Holy Spirit comes the man is renewed and you walk in newness of life, which does mean as a renewed man, you do have some freedom to choose to continue to follow Christ as well as choose to fall away. Huh? And that's where Lutherans are not Calvinists and neither are we Arminian. Yo. Ah, ooh, ooh. Actually, I don't have a question. Huh. I just want to encourage you and tell you how much I appreciate your thoughts. <sighs> You're doing the will of our Lord Jesus, sharing the truth revealed by the word to a hurting and confused world. Keep fighting the good fight, brother. Thank you for bringing the Bible back into the realm of facts where it belongs when this world is trying so hard to make it irrelevant. Sweet action. Rock on. Email. Ah, oh. What is your opinion on how to deal with people like the ones who started the Facebook page, LCMS Own, Ordain Women Now? I know what our biblical doctrine states on the topic and the CTCR has very carefully stated our position. Should these unrepentant Lutherans that support this be treated as tax collectors or put under a minor ban by their pastors? How would you handle it in your own congregation if some of your members attempted starting their own movement? Yikes. One of the problems with Own is that these aren't necessarily just members, these are actually pastors. And you know, what is my position on them? Uh, they're, they're liars um, and, and that's just is kind of straight up bit. They're, they're liars because they're in a church body that publicly states, we believe this, Bible and Confessions. And this is like why we exist, is to be that conservative Lutheran body that holds to all those old stodgy teachings that the world of progressivism doesn't want anymore. And so by saying like, we're here and we are Lutherans just like you, but we want to change it, you're just lying. I mean, that, that's my biggest problem. It has less to do with women's ordination. The fact you can't be honest enough to say, I really belong in the ELCA where they've been doing this for 40 years and uh, everything that comes with it, you know, that's just 
part of the same thing. I, it's, it's who we are. How would I handle members of my own congregation that started a movement to undermine one of the basic tenets of Christian theology? Because women's ordination is about Christology at the end, and don't let anyone tell you it's not. Uh, I'd try to follow Matthew 18 <laughs> and go and talk to them directly. I'd tell them, here's the truth. I'd probably start a Bible study on the topic, say, let's reason together from the scriptures. Let's talk about the scriptures. But if it came down at the end of the day where they're just like, I refuse to believe what those scriptures say. I can't believe it. I won't believe it. I shan't believe it. I shan't believe it. But I'd have to say, well, uh, you know, you, you're you not one of us and you should probably find a church where you belong. And if you don't, then we may have to take more drastic steps to make you. It's called excommunication. But see here now we're dealing with something different. This is also not a private issue. This is a public issue. They are publicly out there saying, we want to change the theology of the Missouri Synod. What if they were to do this with something like justification, teaching that we are justified by our works and that Rome was right? What if they were to do this with something like adultery, teaching that it's okay to cohabit and live with another person you're not married to, you know, as a test run? What if they were to do this with the divinity of Christ, teaching that he's, you know, just a man that God really loved and we can learn a lot from him, but he isn't actually the son of God who atoned for the sins of the world with his blood? What if you do this with any of the clear people pieces of the scripture which have been taught in unity from the beginning of the church until now. So you not only do you have scripture, but you have tradition on your side too. What do you do is you tell them you're wrong. And if you can't admit that you're wrong and be humble enough to let the word of God lead you, then you really ought to go join a heretical church body. And since you think they're orthodox, that should be fine with you and you can call us the heretics. I mean, that's great. Later. See ya. <laughs> <coughs> My fiance asked our former Lutheran pastor whether there would be sin in the next life. He said that scripture doesn't say one way or the other. Huh? I was shocked. Uh-huh. And brought up scriptures that argued differently. Hey, good for you. But he had said that there was no way to know if that was literal. Huh? We left and have since started driving to another city. Is there anything else that can be done besides attending a different parish? If he denies such an important part of a resurrection, what else could creep in? Absolutely, you're right on there. And this is kind of the same point I was making about the women's ordination stuff. It's like, once you start denying things that scripture says and saying, well, I know the text says that, but I can't be sure if it's literal or not. Uh, and there's nothing in the context to tell you, you know, to, to, to do that. I mean, the, the whole text isn't actually telling you this. You're just deciding not to believe it. Basically, it's a slippery slope. And after that, nothing really is sacred anymore. The text is no longer something you need to believe. Now this is a general Protestant problem that goes all the way back to this guy named Zwingli who decided that the word is doesn't really mean is and just instead means symbolizes or represents or spiritualizes or almost is or kind of is or is as if it was but isn't. It's not is, it isn't. Ever since then Protestantism has had this ethos of wanting to go to the scriptures with our heads and say well I'm going to decide what it really means even though it says something. And so we get all the way down to the present day where we're arguing about whether six days means six days or whether I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority means I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority. And then we wonder when the church bodies who decide knocking those pieces down get 40 years down the road, they have people saying, oh, I'm not so sure about this whole son of God thing, you know. Oh, you know, that Matthew 28, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit thing. Well, that was probably added later. I mean, well, once you give license to say, I'm free to decide whether it's true or not, uh, or whether it's literal or not, whatever that means, but I can't be sure what the text really means. I mean, what are you doing being a Christian? Now we're back to the same issue again. You're just a liar. You're just a liar. You just don't want to actually like be a Christian. You just want the benefits of having the name Christian, which really doesn't make any sense because the benefits aren't that great. I mean, seriously, I mean, the, the temporal benefits, I mean, there's not a, like a retirement plan or anything. Seriously. So is there anything you can do? Uh, you could try contacting the district president. I can't make any promises though. I'd like to think the DP would respond by saying, wow, that man's teaching false doctrine. I'll go talk to him. That's what a DP ought to do. Although uh, district presidents, if you're watching, I mean, listen to these people when they call you, they're real people, they need your help. And um, okay. Hey, God bless you taking a stand on what you believe. I know the drive's hard. Hey, all y'all out there, this is the future of Christianity. You want an Orthodox church? You want a law gospel rightly distinguishing church that also gives you word and sacrament spirituality unplagued by the distractions of revivalism? You're going to be driving for it. Just get ready. I mean, it's coming. And if you got a church that's like down the street from you that's doing this, don't move. <laughs> I don't care if that other job in the other city is better. You mean, find another church before you move there. I'm serious. I'm dead serious. All right. <coughs> When 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith, 
test yourself. How do we reconcile this with the assurances that Christ has given us on the cross? Awesome question. This comes down to law and gospel, and this is where if you don't understand the distinction between law and gospel, in many ways the scripture will be a closed book to you. That is to say, it'll be a book which is constantly confusing you and throwing you back on yourself without you really being able to understand what it means. What does Paul say when he says test yourself? He means, I'm going to give you some law. I'm going to tell you what you should be striving for. Here's the bar. Reach for it, because it's true. This is what you ought to do. You should be asking Asking, am I living faithfully? Do I believe the Ten Commandments are true? Do I seek to follow them? Am I trusting the doctrine which I've been given, which is the gospel? Am I trying to destroy it or undermine it with my own thoughts and mind? All these pieces of my life that I actually do do as a regenerated Christian, I ought to be having a conscience about them and aware of them and struggling to an extent when I find that it's not perfect. But I also need to know that this entire section is the law and that's all it is. It has no place in my actual assurance of salvation. In fact, the only thing that you're really bother me is if I start testing myself and I start saying, hey, wow, I look pretty good, you know? I mean, yeah. I mean, that's when I should get scared. Here's a nice quote from Luther, quoted by your very own grandpa, C.F.W. Walther, in his Law and Gospel. He says, our consciences are to be exempt from the law, but our bodies are to obey the law. Huge distinction that. Our consciences are to be exempt from the law, but our bodies are to obey the law. You place the gospel in heaven and the law on earth. In this way, we can call the righteousness that the gospel proclaims the heavenly and divine righteousness, while the righteousness that the law proclaims is an earthly and human righteousness. Be careful to distinguish the righteousness of the gospel from the righteousness of the law with the same great care as when God separates heaven from earth. Therefore, when you are speaking of faith and conscience, leave the law out. It must remain on earth. However, when you are dealing with human works, which is what St. Paul is doing in 2 Corinthians 13, as he's talking about the reconciliation between him and that congregation and how they treat each other, then light the lamp of works or the righteousness of the law. Let the body with its members be subject to the law. But when you ascend to heaven, leave the donkey and its burden on earth. For the conscience before God has nothing to do with the law. The conscience stays in the valley while the donkey with Isaac, that is a type of Christ, goes up the mountain to the sacrifice where the blood is poured and the life is spared. We need to know this point of doctrine. That is the distinction between law and gospel, because it contains the sum of all Christian teaching. Let everyone who would work diligently toward true piety strive with the greatest of care to learn how to make this distinction, not only in speech, but also in truth. It is easy enough to make this distinction in words, but when you are struggling with sin, you will realize that the gospel is a rare guest in a person's conscience, whereas the law is a familiar and daily companion. Therefore, when your conscience is terrified by sin, you should speak like this. There is a time to die, and there is a time to live. There is a time to hear the law, and there is a time to ignore the law. There is a time to hear the gospel, and there is a time to pretend that you are ignorant of the gospel. At that moment, that is, the moment of conflict in conscience when you feel burdened by your sin and are worried about your salvation, let the law be gone and let the gospel come. For now is not the time to hear the law, but the gospel. You have not done anything good. Indeed, you have committed serious sins. I admit that, but I have the forgiveness of sins through Christ. On the other hand, when your conscience is not engaged in this conflict, when you have to discharge the ordinary functions of your office, that means do the right thing, when you must act as a minister, a magistrate, a husband, a teacher, a student, etc., that is not the season to hear the gospel, but rather the law. Those are the times when you are to perform the duty of your vocation. Test yourself then to see whether you are in the faith. Yo, when the law comes, it is actually affecting my conscience, burdening me, causing me to struggle, strive, be guided, look forward, all these things. This is its purpose and it's good. So Paul says, test yourself and you should, Christian, test yourself regularly. Get off your bum. Stop thinking you don't have to get to church every week. Stop thinking you don't have to serve your neighbor. That is not what Christianity is about. You are the servant of all. Act like it. That's the law. Now the gospel is a whole nother thing. This is the assurance of Christ on the cross you're talking about. This is the promise of your baptism. This is the take, eat, this is me for the forgiveness of your sins of the supper. This is word and sacrament spirituality covering you with the blood of Christ. And in that realm, you have full assurance that nothing can tear you from Christ. Neither height, depth, angels, demons, powers, principalities, nothing can tear you from Christ because Christ is the one saving you. Christ is the one saving you. Christ is the one saving you. This is the promise he gives to those who find themselves under that law, believing that law, and then unable to attain that law.
And in this sense, you have the freedom to know you are the king of all, servant of none. Nothing can touch you. But there's just it. Law and gospel is actually two different words. Words both from God, words that are both true. Only one saves, but they're both true. You're servant of all, act like it. You're king of all, freed from all burdens, and promised an inheritance of eternal life. None of your works can harm you. How you live, it affects other people, and in fact, can betray to yourself the fact that you don't believe what you say you believe. I forgive you. Two words. Got it? That's how you reconcile it. You don't treat it like it's a systematic dogmatic issue. You recognize that God is speaking two different ways. He has a way that he created creation to exist. He wants it to be that way. And he's got Jesus who's saving you, period. Both true, one predominates because it's better. It doesn't make the other one go away. Yeah? Yeah. I came from a fundamentalist background where a great deal of emphasis is placed on the conversion experience. My question is, do we become Christians at baptism or is it when we actually come to faith in Christ? That's a fascinating question. What do you mean actually come to faith in Christ? As if baptism doesn't bring you to faith in Christ? It doesn't give you the promise? I wash you? I mean, when God says that, is it not true? And is this salvation not given with faith? I mean, you got the promise that baptism is a washing of regeneration. And since we know salvation and regeneration in Christ is by faith alone, it can't be a washing of regeneration without in some way sparking or enlivening faith? By the power of the words, with the water? Working forgiveness of sins, rescuing from death and the devil? And giving eternal salvation to all who believe this? Are you saying that when you say actual faith, you mean that you don't actually have actual faith until you grow up enough for the Spirit to lead you by word and sacrament to make a conscious decision to accept it? That's kind of a terrifying thought. So when I'm asleep, do I not have actual faith? You know? Actual faith is passive. It's a state of existence that God places you in. It's not something you actively are able to achieve. It does create action. It bursts itself forth in faithful thoughts, words, and deeds. But thoughts, words, and deeds do not make faith. They simply flow from it. Faith is a state of reception, receiving God's word. And so baptism is the seal, sign, mark, active, placing of word upon you individually. Can't miss your head by flying past the sound waves. You're like, oh, it doesn't apply to me. It actually smacks you in the head, gets you wet, water with the word, no way to avoid it, I'm baptized. I guess I can't tell myself I'm not a Christian now because God says I am. That is the conversion experience. God converts you, so believe it. Now, if later you come to a fuller recognition of this, you're like, whoa, I'm living poorly and man, I don't deserve to call myself a Christian. God bless you. That's God's spirit at work in you too. He is renewing you. What does such baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, and a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. So if at some point in your life post-baptism, you cease to have that experience of daily renewal and drowning, whether because you weren't taught to have it or because you just decided not to have it, and then one day you come back and you're like, whoa, man, this is actually true. Well, that's good. You're being converted again, just like you should be every single day. But this is not your first and foremost true true conversion. This is not the place where God has called you. From the very beginning onward, your baptism is one. Your baptism is Christ's cross for you, period. Marking you, period. So that you can trust it. And that's the whole point. It's really about having a rock, a foundation, something to stand on outside of you so that when you are struggling with your sin, you have somewhere to turn other than your own heart. Know what I'm saying? And that's just it. You find out those who put their faith in the conversion experience they feel in their heart, they never get enough of it, and they never really know whether or not they're actually converted. They keep searching, keep looking, for that next big thing, that next something more. There's no contentment, no security. It's a very sad thing. Nothing wrong with actually having experiences. Nothing wrong with actually feeling repentant and wanting to live a better life. Nothing wrong with deciding, you know, I'm going to work harder at doing what Jesus has asked me to do. The problem is when you think that's what makes you a Christian. That's where faith is founded. Faith is founded in the gifts, in the promises. I wash you. Christ is the one saving you. Christ is the one saving you. Yo. <coughs> I have a friend who has been loudly in support of gay marriage for a long time, but is now actually wanting to know with intent to learn why Levitical laws such as don't wear clothes made of more than one fabric aren't followed anymore, which would normally relate then to why people shouldn't use Leviticus 2013 against homosexuality. I told him I would do my best to give an expansive historical answer of the church. What is the best way to approach this? Yikes. Well, the expansive historical answer comes down to the fact that we don't use Leviticus to define Christian morality. Levitical codes were written for the people of Israel to make them a covenant nation, an actual country 
and they had to live according to those laws to remain in that covenant as a country with blessings coming from God. Now, to be sure, there are true eternal moral truths that exist within that code, but not all of that code is those true eternal moral truths. And that's why we don't necessarily go to that code to prove anything. And this is really important to get. I mean, granted, the Ten Commandments are there, but that's not why we keep them. We keep the Ten Commandments because they are a good summary of what Christ has said in the New Testament is the truth of how God designed the world to be, what his law really is. Same thing goes then when you're dealing with homosexuality. I don't need the Old Testament to prove homosexuality is an issue. In fact, I don't even need the Bible to prove it's an issue. All I need is the fact that, uh, well, even from an evolutionary standpoint, the survival of the fittest, I mean, there's only one way to survive and it's by making babies and uh, it takes two to tango, you know? So yeah, in, in the Bible then, the New Testament affirms this understanding that marriage is about procreation and to becoming one for the sake of family and community, which then is the law that we're given in the Ten Commandments. Commandment six, you shall not commit adultery, which means you shall not destroy this marriage covenant and steal from it its purposes and ruin the community in this way, which then leads to a very specific command in Leviticus. It is certainly an abomination for a man to sleep with a man or a woman to sleep with a woman in that way. And then leads to St. Paul in Romans 1 and 2 to basically say the same thing, that this is actually the height of foolishness of sinful man that we would not be able to realize the value of marriage and we would give it up instead pursuing just pure passionate weird lusts that don't even make sense logically. It shows our idiocy that we're just pursuing nothing but our feelings without even recognizing what we're doing. That's Romans 1 and 2. So, you know, there's your expansive biblical answer. Historically, the ancient church did recognize, in fact, this is why we have it, the New Testament is primary. If we just needed the Old Testament, we'd just have the Old Testament. The New Testament is primary the Gospels and letters of Paul. We read the Old Testament through these because this is the Christian scriptures. The Old Testament are the Hebrew scriptures that point to and say the same thing as the Christian scriptures, but in a very different way, a very unique context. All of it tied up with this covenant people of Israel that were made a people and then destroyed. And unless you can kind of bring that historical perspective to it, in some ways it's like you're not going to be able to understand that stuff at all. So, I mean, my advice to you, never quote Leviticus to prove homosexuality is wrong. It's, it's ignorant to do so. Although it's true, I mean, it is still true and the verse is still true. It's just not going to help your cause at all. You want to talk about homosexuality with homosexuals? I wouldn't even talk about the Bible at all. I'd talk about the fact that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, that he's the son of God in history, time, and space, and that he has done this in order to redeem the world from its depravity and corruption, its enslavement to sin, death, and decay under the reign of the very real devil. I'd talk about those things. And uh, if they get to a point where they're like, I believe those things, man, what's it take to be a Christian? I, I want to, wow, I feel like, I feel like I should, like maybe, maybe I should, I should be a better person. Then you start talking about morality at that point. But until then, I mean, there's this idea sometimes that we need to have a person like repent of every possible sin before we would ever tell them the gospel. But this is as foolish as having the penitents in the Middle Ages have to confess every possible sin that they ever committed in order to have it be forgiven. It doesn't work that way. The gospel is a proclamation. It comes at you in your face. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. No more let sin and sorrow reign, nor thorns infest the ground. Know what I'm saying? So anyway, that's where I'd go. I'd start with law, gospel, death and resurrection of Christ, creedal Christianity, and then if you find someone who has got homosexual issues or any kind of adulterous issues at all, and they're like, wow, I, I believe this. Then you start talking about how then shall we live as people who do believe this are waiting for his return. Do we spit on his design of creation and triumph in our sins, sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. In fact, we uphold the law because the law turns out to be, well, the definition of how you love your neighbor as yourself. Right on? Right on. Hope you've enjoyed it. Merry Christmas. Catch you next time.